excellent. Thank you. Um, that was a really exciting talk. I've been saying for years, the Arctica Icelandica is coming, <laughs> and, and now it's nice to see some beta. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to um, talk to you today about the low latitude perspective on this pretty much same topic. Um, so um, a couple years ago, I started um, sort of, I, I actually, uh, well, started looking into what, what do we have in terms of paleo data that can can address um, Atlantic multidecadal climate variability. And, and really the literature seemed to be asking one question and, and that is what's up here. And is there a concentration of variance um, at multidecadal bands in the climate of the Atlantic region um, that extends above the expected red noise background and, and extends, oops, extends back through time. So we have here the classic um, sea surface temperature anomalies in the northern hemisphere and the Atlantic um, detrended. And the question is, what is happening back here? Um, and so um, the, the, the paper that came out of this actually published last year. Um, and essentially in that, I do a detailed list, uh, review of, of what we know. Um, is, I, I sum it up in this single slide. Um, essentially, it seems like the consensus is that there has been significant multi-decadal variability back to the 1700s. But prior to the 1700s, different people say different things. Some people say it doesn't exist. Some people say it's intermittent. Some people say it's persistent. Um, and, and in large part, it seems to me that the, the reason for all of these different answers is that we're looking at different proxies that are actually um, met, uh, responding to different variables. So we're actually looking at apples and oranges. Um, in, many, in, in many cases, it's a single record that people are making their, um, their statements about. And so those local signals may or may not capture the, the um, hemispheric-wide um, North, North Atlantic um, sea surface temperature changes. Um, and so my recommendation for the future after doing this whole, whole review was essentially we need to be sure of what we are re uh, reconstructing. So rather than trying to uh, use somewhat teleconnected variables, say tree rings to reconstruct ocean temperature, which while there is a response, there can be also many other variables that impact those tree rings, and those trees are not living in the ocean. Um, <laughs> so all, all respect to Ed there. Um, but, um, but then in fact, we should be using each variable for what it's best at, so tree rings for looking at terrestrial temperatures and, and, and droughts, and, and marine proxies for looking at, say, surf sea surface temperatures, and then we can actually reconstruct variables that we can um, begin to tease out what's going on. Um, okay, so that's, that's my little soapbox. Um, so I actually did a tropical reconstruction. I tend to be a low latitude kind of gal. And um, the, um, as we've seen, a, a similar map. Um, this is from Amy Clement's recent paper. Um, ah, I keep messing this up. Um, where we have two centers of action, the high latitudes and the low latitudes. Um, there, there seems to probably, I think, be some different dynamics going on in these two different regions. So I think it's interesting to get the higher latitude uh, perspective from records like the Arctica Icelandica. Um, and then we have similarly high resolution, annual resolution um, proxies in the Caribbean and, and the tropical Atlantic to get the low latitude perspective. And the low latitude sea surface temperatures are um, important in part because of, of their connection to uh, hurricane intensities um, and or, or frequencies and um, precipitation anomalies um, in, in other areas. So, so let's look at what I found when I tried to reconstruct all the variables that we had. Um, Okay, so I, I basically said, okay, what do we, we have to have some data selection criteria. So ocean temperature sel selective uh, sensitive paleo proxies, um, that's carbonate, um, strontium calcium, magnesium calcium, oxygen 18, which is of course the dual signal. Um, and then there have been some recent papers um, connecting coral growth with sea surface temperature. It's more of a, um, 
local connection, so, so you have to do a, a local calibration, a bit of ad hoc. Um, I personally prefer the chemistry because that's determined by the thermodynamics of, of crystallization. Um, but um, but, but it, they also, the growth rate records calibrate well. So, um, so another important point of trying to reconstruct um, multi-decadal and decadal scale variability is you certainly have to have high resolution, well-dated proxies. And so that does limit us from sediment cores in most cases. Um, so I, I made a, a requirement of less than five years per sample. Um, I, I expanded it from one year per sample just because um, that helped me get more data. Um, and I think that it, if you have a network of, of proxies, it, you can get away with a little bit lower resolution and still get um, reasonable uh, certainty in your, in your uh, uh, decadal variability. So um, the other thing was, was actually I made a limit of a location of south of 22 degrees north. And that's essentially based on um, this, this record of the um, sea surface temperature, which from uh, Goldenberg et al. 2001. And you can see that this is the, the, uh, was it the first, first EOF of global sea surface temperature after removing the trend and ENSO. Um, and you get this pattern. And, um, and there's, there's clearly this demarcation between the Gulf of Mexico and, and the Caribbean and the tropical Atlantic. Um, there are several proxy records from up in here, um, but it's not highly correlated um, to the, the uh, a AMO index um, or, or multi-decadal sea surface temperature variability that we're trying to target. So I, I did not use those records specifically. Um, so unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of data. Um, so that was the first thing I learned from this. Um, and a take home message is that I was able to get four sites, six records, done. <laughs> um, and so that, that, uh, that makes this less certain. The more data we can get, the more we can reduce our signal to noise ratios. And with paleo data, you've always got quite a bit of uncertainty. Um, so um, the one thing I did that was, um, somewhat unique was that I, I used calibrations from the original publication uh, or a species specific calibration. So this is, this is basically taking the, the paleoclimate theory of how do, do these proxies work and applying them rather than just fitting variants to a target, um, which is, which is a, often done, but I think it can um, mess up some of your signal to noise ratios. So. Um, I've got different, each record is an independent source of data, even though some of them come from the same site. Um, and the, hopefully the, the different noise, the different biases will average out. Ideally, more data would, would help that. Um, so I, I created a, a sort of target calibration. So I took all of the four sites I had and instrumental sea surface temperatures, averaged them up, and got the green curve there. and um, and and it compares fairly well in terms of uh, decadal variability. Certainly there's some high, higher frequency stuff going on, higher amplitude, but you expect that when you're only dealing with four sites um, rather than a large regional average. Um, so comparing my uh, compilation of all of the, of the records, um, that's the purple line with the air bars in, in light purple, um, and then that compared to sort of my target, and it gave me a standard error of reconstruction of 0.34 degrees, um, propagated that into the full reconstruction. Um, just want to point out that back here, we're down to one site. I no longer trust it. Um, this, is, this is sort of back to 1360 has, has the full reconstruction. Um, and so we see a centennial scale variability. Um, that's obviously going to have a big effect on any time series analysis. So I actually uh, sort of assessed that and pulled it out. Um, so the, in gray is the, the time series analysis of that first sing, um, principal component of, of the data, that white curve that we saw just a minute ago. Um, and you can see how that really does uh, contain that centennial variability in the, in the uh, spectrum. So when you subtract that first principal component and repeat the analysis, 
course, your, your centennial scale variability does, goes away, um, but our, our multi-decadal scale variability remains. Interestingly, we have also uh, variability at 35 and 16 years. I kind of think those are harmonics, um, but that I haven't done a lot of work on it. So um, I try to make that go away. I may try to make that peak go away. Um, one, one way I can do that um, is alter, uh, alter the noise floor and, and try to um, see if that's a spurious peak. Can't make it go away. Um, another, another thing I do is um, I actually cut the, the time series. Um, before 1850, we have the instrumental record, which has that very strong sort of 60-year um, apparent oscillation, whether it really is. It's a whole other ball of wax. Um, and so I cut that out to see if that was influencing the record, the, the, the fat, strong 60-year period. And I got the gray, um, the gray line here. So you can see that that approximately 60-year period is pretty robust throughout the, 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 uh, the record. Um, so, so that's sort of an interesting result. We've got this nice uh, reconstruction of the tropical Atlantic Caribbean region back through eight, 1360, and it seems to have a robust approximately 60-year um, sort of band of, of increased variance. Um, the, I, tr I tried various iterations, so you can see the, the little dashed bars there are when I left different proxies out. Um, so I, I would pretty much only trust this data sort of as far as that, that darker, uh, that darker uh, purple um, uh, sort of air bar band. Um, within, within that, I'm fairly, robust, I'm fairly sure we got it right. Um, but, but anything, um, you, anything finer than that, I would say there's still, still too much uncertainty. So comparing it with other AMO reconstructions is interesting. Um, remember, mine is simply a tropical. So to some extent, I don't expect it to be perfectly match anything that has been tuned to the basin as a whole. However, um, the complete lack of correlation is rather disturbing. Um, the, the gray bar here is... Um, is a, a record from Gray et al. based on tree rings uh, from North America, Scandinavia, and the Mediterranean. Um, this is often cited as like the AMO record from Paleo, which I find rather interesting. Um, uh, this one is from Mann et al. Uh, 2009, and, and he pulled that out off of a, from a spatial reconstruction uh, based on a lot of multi proxies, multiple proxies. Um, but in the, rec in, the, in the text, he also notes that it probably has some um, admixture of PDO in it. Um, so so there, there's probably Pacific influence in it. Um, the thing to note is they all pretty much agree on the multi-decadal pattern um, of, in, during the instrumental record, and then they have pretty much no relationship after that. Um, so I would, I would actually say, conclude from that is that we really are not there yet. We're still working on it um, in terms of what the history of uh, sea surface temperatures in this region really are. Um, another thing that I've been working on is, um, am I doing on time? Okay, um, is the um, Pages 2K project. Um, and, and here, a group of us uh, were working with high resolution proxies. We actually did reconstructions um, for particular grid boxes in the tropics. Um, each of these here, so I'll focus on the West Atlantic. Uh, note that we used proxies from areas that are not strongly um, impacted by multi-decadal variability in the Atlantic. So to some extent, there's, there's an issue there in the comparison. Um, the, the, um, we used a composite plus scale methodology, and, um, and we similarly did a leave one out iteration. All of those iterations are, are graphed here. Um, the color bar, the co orange to red color indicates how well um, the, the data validated from our calibration interval, or separate from our calibration interval. Um, and so you can see we, it, it actually didn't, it calibrated okay, but then it didn't validate very well. Um, so we don't have a heck of a lot of, of um, confidence in this middle part, and I would say we have not, as, not that much confidence in this one either. It just happened to be made up of, um, a, a single data site that, that did validate well. Um, so I, I still would like to see multiple records coming in um, before I trust it. Um, so, um, so the take home message is when I put our reconstruction from the, the larger 
the larger work that I did uh, with, with the, the large Pages 2K group, um, we have similar, similarly lack of correlation. Um, so, so we're still working on it. I wanted to highlight uh, a, a, a project um, led by Casey Sanger and Mike Evans, still related to the Pages 2K project, where they're trying to get at high latitude um, uh, perspective. And um, let's see, what do I want to say about this? I don't want to go, I want to go too fast. Um, but basically, they have lower resolution proxies, but um, similarly, they, they extend over the last 2,000 years. And um, they're trying to use uh, proxy surrogate reconstruction. So using information from climate models, um, essentially trying to match the model uh, state to the paleo data, finding a best fit, and then using that to help inform the interpretation of the paleo data. Um, and, and the aspect of this that I think is really interesting is really this, this trying to merge um, or to utilize the, the physics in a climate model to help interpret and deal with the uncertainty in the paleo records. Um, so so this, is a, this is actually um, the Pages 2K trans regional product projects, you can look it up online. You can actually contact Casey and try to join. Um, it's, it's sort of a, try, they're trying to be a community-wide effort. Um, uh, and then the other, the other thing that I think is really exciting is, is that the high latitude um, bivalve records that we just saw a, t a talk on. One last slide I wanted to plug um, a meeting that I'm organizing um, along with several colleagues um, on trying to connect um, modern and paleo observations and, and um, modeling and, and work on, on um, Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, so one of the potential drivers of this sea surface temperature anomaly. So we'll be meeting in May in Boulder, and the, um, you can uh, go online. It's a U.S. Clivar um, Pages um, sponsored meeting, and, um, and yeah, the registration will open up at the end of this month. So uh, go look at that. So in summary, um, we, need that high, we need data from the high latitudes, and it, it's coming. Um, we, uh, we have, I've reconstructed what we've got from the low latitudes, and it seems to show a persistent multidecadal signal in the tropics, um, at least back to 1360. Um, the, a clear history of the North Atlantic multicadal variability is still out there and hopefully getting closer, um, but I would argue that we're not there yet. <laughs>